All right. Good morning. Welcome to the Awake Experience. I'm your host, Eric Veneau, and I have with me today Dr. Joe Brady. Good morning, Joe. How are you doing? Good morning, Eric. How are you doing? Great. Good to see you. Thanks for being on the call today. Thanks for having me. So, um, Dr. Brady, man, we did some uh, we did some qigong together and tai chi at at an event in Denver, Colorado, at a yoga event. And man, I just realized that's just the tip of the iceberg with um, with Dr. Brady. He's a, a Chinese a traditional Chinese medicine doctor, licensed acupuncture. Um, Joe's been teaching Tai Chi since 1967, uh, practicing Tai Chi, and teaching Qigong in, in traditional Chinese medicine for over 30 years. Um, he's been on the faculty um, at the University of Colorado, University of Denver, um, and Joe's developed curriculum for students um, all over the place um, to learn about Tai Chi. Um, he's had just a lifelong dedication to learning about health through, uh, through fitness. So he shares um, fitness with many, many people um, at Porter Hospital and St. Joseph and has, has um, pioneered some medical Qigong programs as well. Um, he's presented at scientific conferences around the country, and he's twice been presenter at, in Oxford, at Oxford University, at the Oxford Roundtable, a very uh, prestigious event, um, prestigious medical conference. Um, so he's an expert in Tai Chi, and um, one big thing I think is, is that he knows how to help us create a state of mind. That's what I want to get into, especially a state of mind that is intrinsically rewarding. Um, so this show, um, The Awake Experience, is all about living the mindful life and to bring in more peace into your life. And uh, any, anything that encourages mindfulness and getting in the body, eating better, living better, that's what we talk about here on The Awake Experience. So I'm just really excited to have uh, Dr. Brady on the show today. So, uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah. I just wanted to, to hear your backstory. You know, how did, how did you build oh. this incredible life? You know, what, what, what brought you to, to become a traditional Chinese medicine doctor, acupuncture, and everything that you do? Well, I grew up in Brooklyn in New York, and um, I went to a high school named Brooklyn Tech. And because it was a science and engineering school, a third of my high school was Chinese. And so I ended up having a lot of Chinese friends growing up in high school. And anyway, make a long story short, I got beat up by a bunch of guys one day and took one of my Chinese friend's advice and went across the river to Chinatown to look me up the roughest, toughest Kung Fu school I could find and learn how to fight and got sucked into this stuff and been doing it ever since. Uh, initially with the Tai Chi and the martial arts on the martial arts side of the medicine and in traditional Chinese medicine, the martial artists tended to be the specialists in pain both in inflicting it and also in making it go away. <laughs> and so I ended up spending a lot of my early career working with martial artists and working with athletes, work with the United States Gymnastics Federation um, on, again, the sports medicine side of Chinese medicine. Uh, and then when I came here to Denver, I started working for the University of Denver at the Institute of Gerontology doing aging research on Tai Chi and Chinese medicine and Qigong. And uh, at that point, I uh, was working more with older adults that already had me multiple medical problems by the time they came to a program, rather than working with healthy, you know, young martial artists and athletes. And so that's when I went back to school and uh, finished up my degree in Chinese medicine. So I do uh, acupuncture, Chinese herbs. And actually, my teachers were from uh, kind of old school in that it included uh, what they call the eight pillars of traditional Chinese medicine. These days, Chinese medicine in the United States has become kind of acupuncture is the only part of it that people are aware of, when in reality, there was quite a bit more to it. And in ancient times, physical activity and the Tai Chi and Qigong were fully a third of the medicine. That's where the patient learns how to take care of themselves rather than going to a doctor to have them do something to you or for you. And that's probably the biggest difference with Chinese medicine compared to the way we do Western medicine uh, and goes along the lines with what your interest is in, in terms of mindfulness. The idea in Chinese medicine basically is that the patient must be an active participant in their own healing rather than just a victim of their disease. And that difference in attitude and taking control makes a big difference in how people recover and, and how people deal with illness and deal with problems. Well, yeah. So I, can, I came across a point in my life when I started, to, you know, I went through that phase where I was angry about GMOs and, and, the, and the type of food that, that, you know, our culture would, would feed us, you know, just where they can make a high profit and it's not so good for you. And I kind of got angry about it. And I did the same with, with my medical care. You know, I'd go to the doctor, they'd see me for five minutes, I'd go home with a pill and I just feel like, 
disempowered, I guess. And again, that sense of empowerment, that sense of self-efficacy is, is kind of at the root in, of how Chinese do their medicine, especially in ancient times. So even like with the GMOs, people don't realize that most of your body's defenses against um, poisons in the environment, in which case there's poisons in the environment all over the place. 90% of all things in nature that cause cancer are naturally occurring. But your body has defenses against that. This is what we call vitamins and minerals and eat your fruits and veggies. If you've got a good nutrition, your body has good defense mechanisms to tear apart poisons and toxins. We get a double whammy in our society and that people kind of eat a crappy diet to begin with. And then any poisons or any toxins or anything, too much alcohol or smoking or whatever they get from the environment, their body doesn't have the ability to fight off the damage as well as it would if they were physically active and eating a decent diet in the first place. So in Chinese medicine, one of the things they do, they acknowledge that there is danger out there in the world. And the idea is to make yourself stronger. Don't be afraid of it, but to make your body strong enough to be able to deal with the challenges in the environment. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, how do you inspire people to um, take that step to start seeing themselves as their own caregiver, their own food chooser. Like, you know, how do, how do you get people? It seems like a big shift there. And once That's you really the problem. Yes. How do you uh, we have more than enough information. Yeah. We have more than enough information in medical libraries around the world to do away with 80% of the diseases that we see. The problem is getting people to do it. And so even when you look at physical activity, I don't think any of your listeners or anybody out there in the country that isn't aware of the fact that exercise is good for you. Right. Everybody knows that. The problem is getting people to do it. Mm -hmm. That's why I tell students that the biggest problem in healthcare these days is not a lack of knowledge, but rather ignorance. Ignorance is not information that you don't have. Ignorance is information that you have and that you choose to ignore. Everybody knows exercise is good for you and getting people to do it is like pulling teeth. Everybody knows what it takes basically to eat a decent diet. And yet getting them to do that is a whole nother thing. And part of the problem, like you're saying, is the self-efficacy part of the equation. People need to feel like they have control of their life. This is one of the reasons the Tai Chi is so successful as a physical activity, because it comes from martial arts. Martial artists have the attitude that you're in control of your own life. That um, even in, in the worst case scenario, and you've got a fight with Julio down on the street corner on Friday afternoon, how well you're prepared for that fight is up to you. How well you're prepared for the diseases that may come up and the problems that may come up as you get older, that in large part is up to you. We had, uh, first time we went to Oxford, we had an opportunity to um, uh, talk to Sierra Coop, former Surgeon General, and get some quotes from him. And his estimate at that time was 80% of the hospitals could be emptied overnight if we could just get people to eat right and get some exercise. That 80% of the nursing homes could be emptied overnight. And the hard part is getting people to do that. When we were at CU Health Sciences Center, we decided instead of studying why Americans are not doing these things, rather to study why the Chinese were doing these things. And to look at societies like China where people are physically active and they do eat a decent diet. And we found some striking differences with the way that we do it in, in our culture. Um, they think exercise is supposed to be fun. They <laughs> think exercise is supposed to involve the mind and body. <laughs> um, people get confused when they come to take a Tai Chi class, they get thrown by the fact that every movement is different. And it's hard to learn, you have to concentrate. To the Chinese, that's the point. <laughs> If you concentrate, the mind is fully engaged on the activity, it doesn't mind doing the activity. But when you make an exercise like we do in the West, where it's one, two, three, four, let's do a few more, and it's boring as hell, then we wonder why people don't do it. They make it interesting. A good example of that, one of the Chinese coaches tell me that the difference between the way the Chinese do weightlifting, they don't use dumbbells. In fact, he looked up the definition of the word dumbbell, and he was wondering if that was a coincidence or if they were trying to make a comment when they named them dumbbells. Anyway, he said that the way you do it differently, if you really want people to be physically active, is if you take a gymnasium, on one side of the room put a bunch of dumbbells, on the other side of the room put a bunch of Tai Chi swords from martial arts, put some children into the room, which will they play with? 
<laughs> the swords are inherently more interesting for the mind. The martial arts for the Chinese is inherently more interesting for the mind than simply doing multiple repetitions of an exercise out of self-discipline. And it's interesting because they've done studies in this country and they found that these attitudes toward physical activity, that if you ask people about physical activity, they'll say that it's boring, that it's hard, that it hurts. And they found that these attitudes have only existed since World War II and that we are the only culture in the world that believe them. They did one study in Italy where they looked at Italian men and they found that Italian men actually think physical activity is fun. They actually think it's enjoyable to take their wives out dancing two or three times a week. American men, we know better. We only take our wives dancing when they make us. <laughs> Meanwhile, if you make it fun that way, you don't notice how much physical activity you're getting. And that's why the Italians live longer than we do. Uh, when you're dancing with somebody that you love, you don't sit there counting the number of repetitions and counting the steps. That would only make it boring. They did another study that looked at Finnish grandmothers. They found that Finnish grandmothers not only thought that physical activity was enjoyable, they thought it was one of the most meaningful things they could do in their retirement was to take the grandkids out in the woods and teach them how to cross-country ski. That's a whole different attitude toward physical activity than we have in the United States. They found these attitudes have only existed since World War II. Hmm. Prior to World War II, Americans were physically active. And they played this really, they did this really strange thing on, on the weekends. Americans would actually get together with friends and go down to the park and bring a picnic basket and a bat and a ball. And they played this game called baseball. That's why it was called America's pastime because that's how we passed the time. Nowadays, we're modern people. We know better. We only, we pay millionaires to play that game for us instead of doing it ourselves. They found that before World War II, Americans on a Sunday after church would go in the churchyard and play basketball. You will not find a church in the Denver area where I live that's over 100 years old that's somewhere on the property, doesn't have a rusted out old basketball hoop mm -hmm. that nobody uses anymore. Mm -hmm. People thought that physical activities was what you did. In the 1950s, we started elevating the enjoyable physical activities to the status of professional sports. And people got the idea that only professional athletes can enjoy physical activity hmm. and that you got to get paid a lot of money. And then for the rest of us, they gave us treadmills and dumbbells. And then we wonder why people don't do it. What we found in studying the Chinese and in studying um, yoga, for example, another good example, cult, other cultures have found that if you make the exercises interesting for the mind, make it something that you're really learning something while you're going through the exercise. Make it into the example of Tai Chi, fill each movement with stories of martial arts heroes of the past and stories of great books of wisdom like the Tao Te Ching that you make the exercise inherently interesting for the mind. And when the mind is fully engaged in the activity, there's no problem getting people to be physically active. There's a big difference in the attitude. Same thing with diets. We tell people in order to eat a healthy diet, you got to move to Boulder and live on rabbit food and sprouts. <laughs> and it's boring and it tastes bad, but it's good for you. So make yourself eat it anyway. And then we wonder why people don't do it. <laughs> The Chinese eat a dramatically healthier diet than Americans do, filled with vegetables and fruits and mostly vegetarian, a little bit of meat for flavor. But the attitude is very different. They believe that no matter how healthy your diet is, nobody's going to eat it if it's not delicious. And so the first rule in Chinese dietary therapy is the food must be delicious. <laughs> they got Dong Jimin Hospital in Beijing. They've got one of their most profitable parts of the hospital is their takeout section for the kitchen where they have gourmet chefs hooked up with Chinese herbal medical doctors that design specific gourmet meals for patients with diabetes and patients with heart disease and patients with health problems. And they've got one whole 100 foot wall that by 430 in the afternoon is just filled with all the takeout orders that people that outpatients come in and pick up their dinner. Um, that's not only delicious, 
but designed specifically to help with whatever their medical conditions are. Again, that's very different than how we do diet in our culture. If you go to an American hospital, there's probably some of the worst dietary things that you'll see. Many hospitals have a McDonald's in the food court. <laughs> so how do we how do we change things? Well, I, so you could try to change the whole system. What I found more effective is just changing my own life and how I do things. That's how it works. Yeah. Um, uh, by the way, are you able to? Um, so are you able to move a little to block that window? We can't see okay. it very good because the light. Yeah, it's making you dark. Power. A little bit. Yeah, you're a little better there. Yeah, tell us about how to make this, this shift without, I'd wait my whole life if I'm going to wait for the hospital to change. And, you know, I know that will happen slowly, but how do, you, how do you take control of your life now? Well, basically, things don't change from the top down. Yeah. Usually when it comes to, like, uh, big institutions, they're like um, uh, a giant oil cargo ship on the ocean. They take a long time to turn around. Change actually comes from the individual. And especially the kind of change that we're talking about. Self-efficacy has to come from inside the individual. You have to believe if that you can take control of your life. In the example of Tai Chi, they start you off by taking control of little things. Many times in life, there's too many things that we don't have control over. With the uh, inauguration going on today as we speak, there's a lot of people feeling out of control and that there's so many things that influence their life that they don't have control over. So the Chinese start with the small stuff. You do have control of your balance, and you can work on your balance right now as we speak. You have control of your breathing, and you can take control of your breathing by doing some breathing exercises. Breathing being a good example, because in many systems, they find that by taking control of your breathing and doing some breathing exercises, which in the Chinese medicine, there's a whole science to it, uh, but it gives you some sense of control of your life. And by taking control of the little things, little by little, you take control of larger and larger issues in your life, um, including your physical activity levels, your diet, things that keep you healthy, the meaningful things that people need to keep their spirit healthy. You need to be engaged in life. One of the most important factors in health in Chinese medicine is you've got to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. If you've got nothing that you're devoting your life to toward making this world a better place, it, then your life just becomes this self-centered interest in your health. We got too many Americans that sit around all day watching commercials, obsessing about their health. Yeah, just to have some more fun. Get out there. Get out there and have some fun. Do something meaningful. Have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Something that came to mind. Um, maybe we could brainstorm a few small things you can do. Uh, you, you said you you have control of your breath, which is huge. Um, in mindfulness practice, of yeah. course, we're always letting the breath get deeper and uh, less less jagged. You know, more smooth. All those practices. And and but one thing I thought of, one simple thing, is instead of bringing flowers, well, you could bring flowers to someone in the hospital, but you could also bring them that meal that they're not getting from the the hospital. You could yeah. bring them a super healthy meal. Uh, even just your presence when somebody's in the hospital, uh, there's a transference of chi, a transference of energy. And again, this is an obvious example for many of my students I teach at the School of Chinese Medicine here. And they, when, you know, can you transfer chi energy from one person to another? Visiting somebody in the hospital is a really good example. If you walk into the room, a friend of the person in the hospital room, you'll immediately see them sit up and smile and their whole aspect brighten and it can make a whole difference in their day and you have very much tonified their energy and helped them toward recovery by doing that. Um, when it comes to the breathing, like we're talking about in the Chinese medicine, there's a whole science to it. And it's uh, used as a way, for example, one aspect is to gain control of the emotions. There are healing sounds for each of the emotions that you practice with the breathing and that transform negative emotions into their positive counterpart. And so in my clinic, I get a lot of mileage out of that because, again, you get people with severe health problems and all kinds of emotional issues and feeling out of control. By taking control of the breathing and using these healing sounds, they can also take control of the emotions and transform the negative emotions in their life into something positive. A uh, really good example is the most common emotion in America today is anger, resentment, and frustration. And anybody, you listeners, don't believe that, just turn on AM radio and dial from one channel to the next to the next, and you'll hear one angry, frustrated person after another shouting into the radio. 
In Chinese medicine, the healing sound for anger, resentment, and frustration is an SH sound. To make an SH sound like sh shoot or sh sugar or you can add whatever syllable you want on the end there depending on how angry you are. But it helps to transform that negative emotion of anger into something positive, which in the West, we don't think of things like this. When we're angry, we tend to fuel the fire. We wear angry slogans on our t-shirts and put angry bumper stickers on our cars. And so we don't think of transforming the emotion. And so when I tell students, you know, I'll ask students, you know, what's the positive emotion for anger? What emotion cures anger? And uh, they never get it. To the Chinese, it's kindness. Kindness is the way you cure anger. One of my best examples, we were teaching Tai Chi at Metro a few years ago, and in the middle of the semester, had, had this kid, 19 years old, in the middle of the semester, and his mother suddenly died. And this kid was pissed. He was angry at his mother for dying. He was angry at his father for not knowing something was wrong. He was angry with the doctors because they couldn't fix it. Anyway, that anger led him to trouble. He ended up taking a baseball bat to somebody's computer at a workplace downtown. That little stunt got him, landed him in Pueblo State Mental Hospital for a two-week psych evaluation. He comes back to class after all that, explains to my wife, you know, why he had missed so much class. He had missed half the class, and he's asking, do I have to flunk the class? Is there any way that I can make it up? You know, can I write a paper? Can I do something to make it up? And my wife had what I thought was a stroke of genius. She told him that the only way to make it up is you got to volunteer to help with the Tournament of Champions. This program for kids with cerebral palsy that my wife was working with, kind of a Special Olympics kind of thing for kids with cerebral palsy. She made him volunteer with, to help with that for two weeks. This was cool, Eric, because you could see the anger just melt off this kid as suddenly he had to show kindness for someone less fortunate than himself. Anyway, the, the breathing is a whole science and used not only to gain control of the breathing, but all of the emotions have similar healing sounds for people to learn how to take control of their emotions, which the Chinese consider a major cause of disease. Unbelievable, Joe. Thanks for all this information. It's incredible. I, I wanted to ask you, um, is there any value at all in rallying against the system? You know, all this, the hospital should be better, the, um, our food should be better. And I know you said that it's about the small things that we can do in our everyday life. I just want to double check that. Is there like zero good? Because I feel like there's zero good about complaining about what's wrong. I, I really feel like I feel totally empowered. Change by yeah. my daily just complaining about what's wrong uh, just leads to more of that anger we were talking about and that resentment. Uh, no, that doesn't fix things. When you look at, uh, for example, politically, when it comes to our healthcare system, for 20 years now, they've been arguing back and forth between Republicans and Democrats and the hospitals and the insurance companies. How are we going to pay for this? Well, this year, our healthcare budget is going to top $3.8 trillion. There is no way that we can pay for that, no matter who makes the decisions about what we do with health care. 80%, 80% of that $3.8 trillion is due to self-inflicted causes, is due to a lack of physical activity, lousy diets, smoking, um, the stress in the world today. These are things that the government can't control. These are things the insurance companies can't control. These are things that the individual has to control in their own life. When it comes to the national scene, there are some things, if you look at other cultures, that can be done. Right now, the United States is ranked 44th in the world when it comes to healthcare systems. We've got the 44th worst healthcare system in the world, despite the fact that we're spending so much money on it. The number one healthcare system in the world is um, Singapore. And one of the things they do different in Singapore is they use Chinese medicine. They have Tai Chi programs, for example, in every park in Singapore. They have what they call health ambassadors that help do health care in the community, the uh, old barefoot doctor's idea that the Chinese used to use, where community members become the doctors and help encourage good behavior and healthy lifestyles. Anyway, they save so much money on the prevention side by actually emphasizing prevention 
that they can afford in Singapore to hire the best surgeons from Harvard Medical School and the best anesthesiologists from the Mayo Clinic. They pay for their medical education. They pay for their relocation fees to go over to Singapore and practice for a set number of years if they paid for their education. And so they enjoy the best of both worlds. They save so much money on the prevention side that they can afford to hire the best surgeons. We can't do that. We spend all of our money waiting until after. And it's deeply rooted in our healthcare system. And in fact, we have a friend that just wrote a book for Oxford University Press, and he uh, dates it all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Uh, the way healthcare developed in the West dates back to the Greek god Aesculapius. He was ordained by Zeus to take care of the health of the whole Greek people. To help him with the task, he had two daughters. The one daughter's name was Hygienia, origin of the word hygiene. And her medical theory was you get people to be physically active and you keep the food clean and you eat a healthy diet and you close over the sewers and you prevent disease. Her sister told her she was crazy, that if you prevent disease, no one will know you did anything. And so why would they donate to your temples? If nobody's getting sick, no one would donate to your temples. Her sister's name was Panacea, origin of the word Panacea. And her medical theory was you don't close over the sewers and you don't get people to be physically active and you don't have them eat a decent diet. Instead, you wait until they get sick and then you wait longer until they are about to die. And then you step in with a panacea and now you have saved their life and they will donate everything they own to your temples. Within a few years, Hygienia's temples had fallen into ruin and panacea's temples thrived. Origins of modern medicine. I think as long as there's a for-profit motive in healthcare, I don't think there's any way that we're going to be able to pay for it. We're already paying the price for that with $600 EpiPens. An EpiPen costs $1 to make. In China, that same EpiPen costs $6. The Chinese figure 600% profit is plenty. We charge $600 for that same EpiPen because you've got a mother with a child that's allergic to peanuts and the kid could die and you got her by the throat and she's got no choice but to pay it. Anyway, the only way I see that we're gonna fix that is people have to take control of healthcare for themselves. We have to stop thinking of healthcare as an industry and think of healthcare as something that we do every day with every meal and every walk that we take and everything that we do. You know, it's funny you say that when, when, I, um, when I used you know, traditional Chinese medicine, um, it's kind of like, uh, if I'm healthy all the time, I don't quite get what they're doing. It's so strange to think that way, though. I'm always healthy. That's the point. It's wonderful. Like, if I go to acupuncture and do all these great things, but I do have that in the back of my mind just because of the way I was raised in our culture that I should pay only if they're fixing something that's broken. But that's ridiculous. Keep me healthy, man. That's what I want to pay for. Yes. <laughs> but that, again, that's not the way we think about it. So in Chinese medicine, like with the acupuncture, yeah, usually it's people only come in when they have a health problem. The medicine works better as a preventive, but it also works well in conjunction with Western medicine. I just this last year, I've been involved in two acupuncture anesthesias here in Denver, uh, out at uh, Lutheran Hospital uh, with a surgeon that um, specializes, for example, that one patient had needed a hernia operation and she had had a very uh, violent reaction to anesthesia in the past. And so they were all in favor of doing acupuncture anesthesia. Um, and it was cool. The patient uh, with nothing but needles and no anesthesia at all, uh, the patient was awake and talking to the surgeon and actually joking with the surgeon throughout the surgery. Patient did fine. I was scared to death. I figured if she yelled ouch from under that sheet one time, we were screwed. Uh, <laughs> but she did fine. We've also been doing quite a bit with, in Colorado at least, the opioid epidemic is rampant. We're getting 40 deaths a month from opioid drugs. And meanwhile, we've got 29 good randomly controlled studies 
that show that acupuncture works better for pain control than the opioid drugs and then Oxycontin and um, uh, several others. And so with the acupuncture, uh, and they even have a really good idea of how it works in that when you get the arrival of chi, there's a section in the thalamus and hypothalamus that controls opioid release in the body that lights up like a Christmas tree. When it's done properly, you stimulate the body to release its own opioids to deal with pain rather than having to become addicted to pharmaceutical opioids. Um, this is a much more natural way of taking care of the health problems even after they've developed. Now, I'd prefer that somebody deal with their back pain by being physically active and doing some good stretching before it hurts. But even after it hurts, there's things that can be done that don't have to require all kinds of massive technological interventions to deal with it. They're much simpler ways. Again, the acupuncture being a good example. Wow. So to be fair for, to um, Western medicine, can you talk a little bit about where Western medicine is currently strong or what, when you would use Western medicine? What we do best is when it comes to uh, – my wife and I have a friend of ours, Dr. Walter Bortz. He's the former head of the American Geriatric Society, and he gave a grand rounds lecture here at CU Med School a few years ago called uh, When Lightning Strikes. Our medicine is best when lightning strikes. When some little kid gets hit by a bus, uh, they have a saying in Chinese medicine in China that if somebody gets hit by a bus in the streets of Beijing, they don't lay in the streets saying, take me to an herbalist. They want to go to Dong Jinmen Hospital and Roosevelt Hospital where they have a Western-style intensive care unit and a trauma unit. That's what we do best. We have the opportunity to save lives. In ancient Chinese medicine, they would have loved to have been able to do surgery on a tumor successfully. They have treatments and herbs, but surgery works better. In which case, there's very much in countries like Singapore, in fact, of the top five healthcare systems in the world, four of them use Chinese medicine as well as Western medicine. That's again, Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, and the fifth one is Italy. They don't do Chinese medicine, but they got this whole Mediterranean diet thing happening. Um, but the emphasis is on prevention, in which case the Western medicine, the technological stuff, the life-saving stuff can be saved for when it's really needed. What, even with the surgeon, we worked at CU Med School for many years and worked with many doctors. And what they love to do is save lives. And they love to be able to take with that kid that got hit by a bus and save his life. That's what they do, and that's what they do well. What they don't like so much is dealing with that 84-year-old woman with arthritis. They can't cure her. They can only make her feel better. In Chinese medicine, we excel in that. We can't necessarily save the kid's life when he gets hit by the bus, but we can help him deal with the pain after the surgeon's done fixing it. There's very much room in the world for the two medicines to come together with great benefit for everyone. One is to use more preventive medicine, Chinese medicine and others, to keep the costs down and to use the Western medicine where it's appropriate to save lives. I have to I have to dedicate this episode to my grandmother. She's 93 years old, and she's so active. She goes to the senior center and and does movement and yoga. And um, her hip is giving her a lot of trouble. I guess all the cartilage in between is wearing down, and they say and it's bone on bone. So yeah, she, nobody gets out of this life without something. Right, there's going to be some pain and, and suffering. But she called me and asked, you know, my advice. She knows I'm into wellness, and and I did recommend um, acupuncture. Uh, for her. It would help her keep her comfortable. And then if she's comfortable and can move comfortably, it can encourage her to be more active and keep it strong. And that can forestall the day that there may come a point at some point when she needs that hip surgery and there's nothing else that's working. But for most of my older adults that I work with, the longer they can put that off, the happier they are. Yeah, and so the trick she said to me, I'm sorry, she, she said to me, she, the um, opioids, I think probably is what they were going to try to put her on. She could only do Tylenol. It made her belly sick. She doesn't want to feel all spaced out. So it was interesting to see someone of that generation really seeking something um, more holistic. I, so it could be very helpful to her. And of course, 
eventually that, you know, there's other options that Western medicine can help with, but that should, maybe that should be offered to her. Uh, most definitely. Again, we've got 29 good randomly controlled studies now on 17,000 people that show that uh, acupuncture works better for pain than the opioid drugs. And the worst side effect we get with the acupuncture is occasionally we'll leave a little bruise where we put the needle in. Where the side effect with the opioid drugs is you could die. And I was surprised to learn, I went to a, a conference at the Anschutz Medical Center here and with the head of the School of Pharmacy, I was surprised to find how many people die on their very first dose of hydrocodone. You tend to think of it as somebody that gets addicted to it and starts taking more and more. No, these drugs are dangerous enough to many of these people die the very first time they ever put a pill in their mouth. And yet they are one of the most profitable drugs for the drug companies. In fact, one shocking thing now is the drug companies now spend more on lobbyists to prevent any laws against opioid drugs than the NRA spends on lobbyists to keep guns in people's hands. I was shocked to find that out, but it's interesting how much money there is in people dying, whether it's guns or opioids. So, so that, um, makes me want to not be part of the system in a way. So I'm curious, I, I just had to, um, my wife stopped working for a little while to go to nursing school. So I needed to take care of insurance for our family. And as I'm signing up for this insurance, I'm realizing it's so expensive from this conversation, not because the insurance companies are greedy. It's because the system is, is everyone's so sick. And, and you said 80% of the demand on healthcare is self-inflicted. Yeah. So, so uh, we're all bearing that cost, of course. Um, so it, it tempts me to not want to use that money for insurance and instead use it on traditional Chinese medicine. Um, do you know, are there any insurance, pro but also, I guess you want to have major med too. So if you do get hit by a bus, exactly. Uh, is, is there a combination insurance policy that you know of or, or what would you advise? There are many insurance companies now that will cover acupuncture. I don't take insurance in my clinic because I'd have to hire three people just to do the paperwork and radically increase my prices. But with, in my clinic, we charge $60 for a treatment, which is right at or about where people pay for their copay for a doctor's visit these days. And so most of my patients actually will save a little money if they don't go through their insurance. But I do have many of my patients that their insurance will cover it. They give them kind of a flex account where they can spend on out-of-pocket expenses for things like chiropractic and acupuncture and yoga classes and other things that are, uh, the insurance company approves for their health. In which case, I give the patient a fancy look and receipt at the end of the month, and they get reimbursed by their insurance company for doing that. I think that's a good way to handle it because, again, that puts control back in the patient's hands, it gives them control of the day-to-day -day kinds of health needs that they have, and at the same time gives them that catastrophic insurance for that um, severe health problem that may come up at some point in their life. Do you happen to know any, any health insurers that are leading that you could specifically name that, that, that people could look into that want that combination of major it med? It changes too rapidly. Okay. It changes too rapidly. So what you have to do is check with your insurance company. And ideally, people should check with their insurance company before they sign up with an insurance company and see what they will cover for preventive care. The Affordable Care Act did put in large parts to make them cover a lot of this prevention. When they do away with the Affordable Care Act, I don't know what's going to happen to all that. Um, but I, I think that's everybody's in that boat right now. We're not sure what's going to happen with health care. But I do know this. If people don't start taking care of themselves, there's no way we can afford health care in any case. And probably more important for the individual, if you take care of your own health now, then you have to worry a lot less about how you're going to pay for it when the big stuff comes along because you got a good shot. You can prevent a lot of that big stuff. Right now, some of the most expensive things in our healthcare system are one is uncontrolled heart disease, and that's almost entirely controllable with diet and exercise, um, and in some cases, some medications. Uh, and the second most expensive thing is falls and broken hips. 
in Australia and in New Zealand now, they have large government-sponsored programs in Tai Chi in every park. And I had the one researcher from New Zealand um, tell me that they found they can take a third off their healthcare costs just off the top, just if they can simply get grandma working on her balance. He said the simplest way to reduce healthcare costs is keep grandma out of the emergency room. If she works on her balance and does some Tai Chi and prevents the fall, that's money in the bank for everybody. A good friend of mine that runs a bunch of yoga studios, um, he feels like the people that are currently, the system that's currently in place won't be the system that fills this, uh, that, that fuels this, this new movement that needs to happen. Um, do you feel that way as well? Or, or do you feel like there's a new group of people like yourself and, and that, are, that are just creating a new system that when the old one breaks or continues to break, will just continue to grow? Is that the way to go at it? There's a lot of people trying, but to be honest with you, Eric, right now it's going the other way. Hmm. People are less physically active than they've ever been. They eat worse diets than they ever have. The baby boomers, for example, they knew more about their parents than their parents did about the value of physical activity, but they do it less. Hmm. Uh, They know these things are good for you, but they don't do them. Their parents didn't know a lot about nutrition. They, my grandmother had Wonder Bread on the table. She thought that was great. But my grandmother's generation, most of the meals they ate were home-cooked meals. So on the whole, they were much more wholesome than we eat today. My grandmother's generation, they didn't know much about physical activity, but they lived active, vigorous lives where we live our lives sitting in front of a computer screen and behind the wheel of a car and in front of a TV screen. Right now, I was shocked to learn the baby boomer generation. Right now, twice as many baby boomers have to use a cane or a walker to get around than did their parents or their grandparents' generation at the same age. We are already more frail than our grandparents were because we don't do these things. And I, right now, this isn't getting better. When they first passed the Affordable Care Act, I've been involved in public health and trying to promote this stuff my whole career. And I was all cheering the Affordable Care Act, thinking that they'd put in some strong prevention stuff. It actually had the opposite effect. They defined prevention as early screening for disease. So what used to be the nine health fair, where they had all these healthy activities, now has become the nine disease fair, where they just screen you to see what drugs you should be on. I was very disappointed in that. And don't get me wrong, there's people in nine health fair trying to influence that and change that and make that better. But it's the way our society is going right now. When the Affordable Care Act was uh, introduced, people started dropping physical activity classes all over the place. I know one senior center here in Denver where they had to fire 30 fitness instructors in the two years after the Affordable Care Act because people stopped going for physical activity classes. People figured, hey, I got insurance now, why should I be active? So unfortunately, that made it worse instead of better. I don't know what's gonna happen with that. I do think that the costs at some point are gonna be so outrageous that we have to do something. I'm hoping that what people do is take control of their health again and take health care back from the corporations and make it something that we do for ourselves, not something that we pay for. And that's exactly what this show is all about. It's, it's so empowering, man. I just, I love having control of my food and my lifestyle. And I love having a good time when I'm physically active with, with yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong. It, it's wonderful. It just feels better. I do have, it's funny you mentioned the Nine Health Fair. Um, I'm meeting with the Nine Health Fair later today. Uh, they just brought in a new CEO who's much more open and a good friend of mine, Marla Rodriguez. And she started the Yoga Open a couple years ago um, as part of the Nine Health Fair because they realized that um, there's this whole movement of, of wellness and, and taking care of yourself before you get sick. And uh, I'm really excited to meet with her today. We're actually proposing to have um, a full day of speakers like yourself um, there. Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually considering being the MC for it and, and having a whole day of wellness that 
does coincide. So that way you can. I mean, no, we'll put in some Tai Chi. We'll get some acupuncture. We'll get some nutrition stuff. We did one last year because, again, I do support the, the, the event. It's an important event. We did one last year, and we had this whole fitness center. Yep. You know, different kinds of fitness and nobody was coming over it is tough nobody to um, get people to, to the, that what so we yeah, took we, down the sign that <laughs> we took down the sign and we put up a new sign that said the non-communicable diseases vaccine station okay and all of a sudden people started rushing over <laughs> we told them the vaccine was here do some exercise oh that's great fantastic whatever it changed if you call it something healthy they're not interested if you call it non-communicable diseases prevention, then all of a sudden, ooh, I better be get involved in that. Oh, well, we'll brainstorm. That'll, That'll be fun. <laughs> it's, it's exactly what happened last year. Yeah, we, we did have a nice um, – we had a panel of wellness speakers last year too. And we're moving in the right direction. It's really exciting. Um, and we have to – people have to change their mentality uh, or their, to be healthy before they get sick. And um, that's true. It's going to take some time and effort. But that's been your whole career. Yes. So um, let's let's get to the part where um, you give us three things. I ask this on every every awake experience show um, because I feel like our audience is taking control of their life, and it's very inspiring. And they're they're going to do these things. So, what are three really useful, actionable things that people can start doing today um, from all your experience? Okay. Um, uh, again, I'll steal a little bit from our friend Walter Bortz. Okay. And he calls it the longevity game, and all your listeners can play. You get points. So for all your listeners, before this day is out, they got to eat a piece of fruit. Am I asking too much? No. So for that, you get one point. Before this day is out, you got to eat a vegetable. Again, I'm not asking too much, am I? No. For that, you get one point. Before this day is out, your listeners need to do some kind of physical activity. And I don't know enough about their health to give them a prescription, but I do know they were healthy enough to walk from their bed to their computer to watch this. So their homework is before you go back to bed, do one lap around the house and every little bit helps. For that, you get one point. Then the last part, and this is so important that for this, you get two points. Before this day is out to do something to make yourself useful in this world. That's so important for our health that that's worth two points. He who dies with the most points wins. Well said, Joe. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Brady. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. Well, tell me, um, we, we have a few more things to cover here. Um, what's a great book that you would recommend or an online resource for people to take control of their health and use traditional Chinese medicine? in their life? Well, one is in it where we've got an experimental blog website that we're working on uh, with some, some of the people from Oxford and trying to provide information for folks. It's just in the development stages, but people can go to it now. It's the barefootdoctorsjournal.org. And the idea of the barefoot doctors in Chinese medicine was to make average people knowledgeable enough about health to be able to take care of their own health and encourage people around them, inspire the people around them to be physically active and take control of their health. And we want to have lots of simple information that people can take action on and uh, recipes from gourmet chefs about healthy foods that you can eat. Again, the website's just in its development stage, but um, again, it's the barefootdoctorsjournal.org. And that would be a good resource for them, especially as time goes by and we get more up. Um, another good book on Chinese medicine is uh, Between Heaven and Earth by Harriet Bienfield. And that's kind of uh, a good introduction to Chinese medicine and all the things that it covers. And it's actually readable. Most Chinese medical books read like a medical book and um, are really good for insomnia. <laughs> but um, that one actually reads in an interesting fashion. So students usually enjoy reading that book. So read Between Heaven and Earth and check out the website, barefootdoctorsjournal.org. There you go. Great. And then um, can you tell us more, um, Dr. Brady, about how we can work with you um, online or if you happen to be here in Colorado, like to, to go to your school or, you know. 
Uh, my clinic is located, my, we have a traditional Chinese medicine clinic that's located down um, on York and Colfax, down by City Park and East High and Tatter Cover. Um, and again, they can find information on that website or our website for our Tai Chi classes, TaiChiDenver.com. And uh, that'll give you information about classes. We do classes in, all, all over town uh, that people can be involved with. Great. And now you're coming to speak and, and teach at the Awake Experience, which is an event here in, in Denver, Colorado, February 12th, or, or Jackie, I understand it might yeah, be. No, my, my, I think my wife is planning on doing that. She's looking forward to it. Great. Um, so that day, um, we're going to record that actually, and it's going to go up on the Awake Experience okay. Community website. So um, if you're listening to the, the podcast or watching us today, uh, you can look forward to some teachings from, from Joe and or Jackie and then um, and, and watch it afterwards too. So. Uh, thanks for your time, Dr. Brady. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a great day. You too.